Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Wanted to get a jump on uh, Halloween 2022. So I looked around for a homicide murder mystery story that uh, was befitting of the um, Halloween tradition of horror, terror, uh, role play, people uh, not being who you think they are, deception, black magic, right? Invisible hand, invisible hand stuff. Anyway, this story um, doesn't necessarily involve the clandestine services. I mean, at this point, you know, any story that's presented in the national news, I'm going to say has a really high chance of being involved with the uh, clandestine services. But I don't know. I wasn't born when this happened. Uh, this is a story that happened on Halloween 1957. 65 years ago. It was dubbed by the media as the trick-or-treat murder. It was also uh, referred to as the bizarre lesbian murder scandal. Anyway, uh, let me just tell you that it involves Hollywood. It involves uh, residences in and around the uh, hot zone of Hollywood, where the Dolby Theater is, where the Roosevelt Hotel is, where the Magic Castle is located. You know, it's where Charlie Manson had an apartment. It's where Charlie Watson had an apartment. It's where Bernard Crow had an apartment. It's where Janis, Janis Joplin was put to sleep on October 4th, 1970, right across the street from the Magic Castle on Franklin Avenue. And um, this story does hit some of those buttons. You know, this is also the neighborhood that uh, previous murders have been known to happen. I'll be specific in case you've forgotten. Um, this is the neighborhood where, um, where John Zwire, age 33, was shot in the back of the head with a 38 pistol on um, July 16th, 1969. That's Art Linklater's son-in-law, who's married to Art Linklater's daughter, Dawn who was 29 years old at the time. John Zwire, an insurance salesman, shot, and they called that a suicide. Shot by, while sitting next to the swimming pool in the morning uh, on a work day, July 16, 1969. It's the same neighborhood that Diane Linklater, three months later, gets tossed out of her sixth floor apartment at the Shoreham Towers onto the sidewalk at uh, North Horn Avenue on October 4th, 1969. It's that neighborhood. It's the neighborhood where across the street from Diane Linklater's suicide into the sidewalk where Connie Monty was murder-suicided on October 8th, 1969, after she returned from Diane Linklater's memorial services on Wednesday. That's a Wednesday, October 8th, 1969. It's a Wednesday. Diane Linklater was killed Saturday morning at 9 o'clock whilst baking cookies and she was tossed off her sixth floor apartment window. Like I said, it's the Janis Joplin neighborhood. It's the Dominic Dunn was strangulated neighborhood. Remember the daughter of uh, Dominic Dunn? Well, he had a daughter named Dominique Dunn, age 22. She was murdered on November 4th, 1982 in this neighborhood close to Sunset Boulevard. Close to Hollywood Boulevard. It's the same neighborhood Rebecca Schaefer was shot in the chest at age 21. Rebecca Schaefer on July 18, 1989. It's uh, the same neighborhood that Ashley Ellerman, Ashley Ellerman, age 22, bayoneted 47 times on February 21st, 2001, while she had a date with Ashton Kutcher, who did show up and then was concerned that he left his fingerprints on the front doorknob. That was his main concern when he heard the news that his date was bayoneted 47 times. He goes, oh my God, I left my fingerprints on the front door. That's Ashton Kutcher. He's in the cult. This is the neighborhood where Lindsey Perlman died this year on February 18th, 19, uh, 2022. On February 18th. This is before the Anne Heche uh, fake fiery car crash. February 18th, 2022, Lindsay Perlman, who's in the entertainment television acting business as an actress, 
She dies at age 43 on February 18, 2022, near the Runyon Canyon Gate. It's walking distance from Janis Joplin's crime scene. So, anyway, if we go a little bit further north to North Hollywood, which is admittedly a little bit further up Highway 101, the Hollywood Freeway, a little bit up the way, I don't know, four miles up the way, it's not that far. So, it's a little bit askewed from this area that I just described, which is Hollywood proper. You know, anywhere around the Dolby Theater, around the Magic Castle, around the Church of Scientology Visitor Center. Did you know that's there too? The Church of Scientology and the Magic Castle and the Academy Awards specifically built television theater, Dolby, are all within a couple blocks of each other. I mean, within less than two blocks. And it's close to Capitol Records, the disc-shaped, you know, tower off of Hollywood Freeway, Capitol Records, where Elvis recorded. All right, so uh, it's the same neighborhood, same zip code. My murder has to do with Peter Fabiano, age 35, on Halloween, trick or treat. It involves uh, his wife, Betty, uh, who um, is older. There's a lot of confusion in the details. I had to do some double and triple checking because guess what, people? They don't get the names right. They don't get the ages correct. They don't tell the whole story. In fact, they never tell you what you want to know, right? It's to change your bias. Everyone has a certain, certain, can be led a certain way through linguistics, through applied linguistics. That's what Noam Chomsky is all about. He's really about applied linguistics. I don't think he knows anything about linguistics. He knows about applied linguistics, which let me just uh, paraphrase what l applied linguistics mean. Liar, liar, pants on fire, storytelling. That's applied linguistics. I will give you as very specific examples of it in a minute, but I've lured you in under this, um, this Halloween 1957, which is a Thursday night story. So you have a situation where this fellow by the name of Peter Fabiano, age 35, he was a United States Marine, served in World War II, and in New York, remember New York, right? He meets uh, a divorcee, recently divorced, Betty, who has two young children, and uh, they get married, and she's, uh, she's four years older than him, all right? So by the time we get out to... I believe they met sometime after World War II, which let's say it's 1947. And then uh, they moved to Hollywood. They move out to the West Coast of Hollywood, where uh, Peter Fabiano, who was a truck driver in New York, he becomes a beauty salon owner in Hollywood. Owned two beauty salons, which Betty helped him run. All right, so that's interesting, right? They have two beauty salons, and uh, they hire a woman whose name is uh, Joan Rabel. Joan Rabel, and this is in 1956, approximately, 56, 57. Things move real quick in this story, so by this time... Betty Fabiano's children are teenagers, and uh, one is uh, in the military, I believe down in San Pedro way, you know, near Long Beach, and then she has a daughter, Joan, who lives at home, which is confusing because, not to be confused with Joan Rebel, who is a lesbian who they hire as a beauty technician at the store, and Betty Fabiano is a very beguiling redhead beauty. Anyway, those two end up, I guess, in the same salon. They spend a lot of time together, and they they uh, become very friendly with each other. You should know that homosexuality was uh, illegal in 1957 in the state of California, so we never used those terms at, at that time unless someone was going to, that would lead to an arrest and possible conviction. So, um, where do I go next? Um, Betty confides in Joan Rebel, who is uh, about the same age. 
1957, Joan Rebel is age 40. She was married but is divorced. She still goes by Mrs. Rebel. That's how she disguises her lesbian status is by using the acronym Mrs. And um, Betty Fabiano is married to Peter and she's 39 years old and Joan is a year older, age 40. Anyway, um, Betty's not happy with her marriage to Peter Fabiano. She moves out of the house. She moves in with Joan Rebel, and they have their, you know, lesbian household. Not really sure what the daughter Joan was doing or who she lived with. Perhaps she stayed with Peter. Anyway, Peter was her stepfather. So then, uh, I don't know, maybe they have a lover spat or something and Joan returns to the Peter Fabiano household. Never mind the complexity of that. Every all three of these people, Peter Fabiano, Betty Fabiano, who owned the two salons, and then their employee, Joan Rebel, the lesbian. Those three all work at the same business, right? So I don't know how all that worked, you know, with the bed hopping, but uh, there was some bed hopping going on here. And then um, Betty ends up moving back with Peter to work on her marriage. And, um, and then Peter issues an ultimatum to Betty saying that I don't want you to ever see, you know, Joan Rebel anymore. So to me, that's code for they must have uh, fired her, you know, or terminated her employment. And you should know that, that Joan Rebel lives somewhere around Sunset Boulevard in close proximity to... Uh, North Horn Avenue, kind of sort of where Diane Linklater was murdered, somewhere around there. Anyway, while Joan Rebel is now looking for work, she's also a uh, freelance photographer, and she becomes acquainted in that neighborhood, that same neighborhood that I referred to as kind of the Bermuda Triangle of death to, to women, <laughs> homicides for women. Uh, she meets uh, this woman whose real name is Mrs. Goldwyn Pizer. But she doesn't go by Goldwyn because I guess it's too Jewish. She, so she goes by Golden A. Golden A. Pizer. Golden A. Pizer. And she's a little older. She's 43. <laughs> so we have the players are Peter Fabiano, 35, the man. He's the youngest. Then we have his wife, Betty Fabiano, who's bisexual, and she's 39. And then we have Joan Rebel, who's 40, and she's the single lesbian. And then we have the uh, Goldene Pizer, age 43, who's recently divorced, who looks like she's bisexual. And... Those are the key players in this homicide. So I've given you the situation is that uh, three of those four players all worked at the beauty salon. Joan Rebel was asked to leave um, and then given an ultimatum, I can't see you anymore by Betty Fabiano. And then uh, Joan then befriends her coffee partner, uh, Golden A. Pizer. And they start talking about this evil Peter Fabiano who's causing all kinds of trouble for Betty, who Gold Dene has never met. And uh, so, let's see. I'll just read you some of the uh, news articles on this, which may or may not be uh, completely true. It was also uh, indicated that, uh, well, I'll come back to this. Svengali spell has something to do with this story. You know, before we had MK Ultra, we had the 19, 1894 novel <laughs> by George du Maurier, Mar who wrote a story about this Svengali character who who webs. He's like a spider. He webs. He weaves webs to entangle people and seduces them to cast spells upon them. Anyway, with respect to the, uh, let me just read you here, trick-or-treat terror, 
1957. All right, so you know the hours that kids trick or treat, right? So it's October 31st, Thursday night. I think sundown is probably around, you know, 645 in California. And they give out candy uh, in the household of North Hollywood, which is where Peter and Betty Fabiano live in North Hollywood, which to be specific is up kind of where William Shatner had his third wife go drowning in the swimming pool in Studio City. So it's near Lancashire, it's Burbank, it's, um, it's where the Hollywood studios are. It's where the CBS and NBC studios are located. That's North Hollywood. That's in close proximity to North Hollywood, right there, near the Hollywood freeway. And All right, so let me make sure I got this straight. Peter uh, Fabiano is 35-year-old owner of a hair, hair salons, and he's been roused to answer the door at 11 p.m. now. See, so you, most of the kids have come and got their candy, and now it's 11 o'clock and the family's gone to bed, which is uh, Betty's gone to bed. Peter Fabiano's gone to bed, and the stepdaughter, Joan, has gone to bed. All right, so everyone's now in their beds. And uh, there's a reason for that. They've turned the lights out. The lights are out, see? So typically you don't ring the doorbell of a home whose lights are out on the front door, right? So in this case, the lights are out, but the doorbell rings at 11 p.m. So Peter's a bit annoyed because he doesn't think that's funny because they're, you know, giving out most of their candy. So anyway, supposedly he's a bit annoyed as the children have in the neighborhood have already collect, happily collected their treats hours earlier. The tardy trick-or-treater was also taller than the previous revelers, you know, because you expect children, right? And this is an adult, this is an adult person, <laughs> solo, single on the doorstep. Anyway, dressed in a rather grotesque, Gar garishly painted face with a domino mask and wearing men's clothing of blue jeans, a khaki jacket, and red gloves, holding up a paper bag that concealed a 38 Special pistol. The disguised stranger answered the homeowner's query about the, home the homeowner's query, which was Peter Fabiano's question of, it's a little late for this, isn't it? And the woman at the door answered, no. Then she proceeded to shoot Peter Fabiano in the chest and then ran and fled from the house to a car who was awaiting her, driven by Joan Rebel, age 40. All right. Upon hearing the shot that followed Peter's complaint about the late hour, his wife rushed to the door, but the killer had already fled. Betty, the wife, a redhead beauty, told police that she was 36 years old and had two teenage children. Well, she's 39 years old, so I don't know why she would tell the police she's 36. She's 39. Anyway, Peter, the successful owner and operator of two beauty salons, had served in World War II. The couple appeared to be a picture-perfect couple as they were the artist of that ideal portrait. Peter had ever been his wife's regular hairstylist as well. That figures. The strange crime occurred in Sun Valley, California, which is actually the area in and around where Lockheed Martin is located in the Burbank uh, Hollywood Airport area, in close proximity to, you know, um, Warner Brothers, Toluca Lake, Studio City. It's, you know, within five or six miles away. It was dubbed as the trick-or-treat murder in the press. One local newspaper coined it a more dramatic capture as, caption as, a murder as fantastic as the spirits of Halloween. Indeed it was, not least because of the bonds among the three women that led to this crime and the tantalizing 1950s society story. 
As it turns out, Gol Diné, a most dazzling vintage name ever, the most dazzling. Pfizer was age 43, a bookish medical secretary, transcriber at a children's hospital in Pasadena, and an unlikely prospect for a cold-blooded killer. Like Betty, Goldene had reddish hair. Mm, interesting. So this Joan uh, Rebel, she likes redheads. So she was a daughter of a furniture store owner, and she graduated from Los Angeles High School in 1934, and she apparently was married 10 years earlier, but was either divorced or widowed by the time she met Joan Rebel, who was 40 years old and lived approximately one mile from Goal Diné's bungalow court flat near Sunset Strip in close proximity to the Dolby Theater. Joan's entire life is shrouded in mystery. Well, of course, just like the Sharon Tate story is shrouded with murder. Because if they actually told you who her father was and who her mother was and what they did for a living, then it would completely torpedo the whole Manson cult, you know, mendacity because you'd say, well, wait a minute, they're CIA. <laughs> well, in this case, I can't say that Jones CIA because they did a really good job of, you know, expunging any records about this, uh, this lesbian killer, Joan Rebel, who actually didn't kill anyone. Remember, it was... Uh, Golden A. Pizer's the one who shot through the paper bag. She did it, the 43-year-old woman. Anyway, so those two met, and it was later uh, described by Golden A. that uh, she became coffee gossip pals with uh, Joan Rebel, and they spent three months discussing Peter Fabiano and uh, how to kill him. Because he was such an evil person, despite the fact that uh, Gold Dene never met Betty, nor had she ever met Peter Fabiano, but she had this Svengali spell put upon her, a MK Ultra type mind control, to where she agreed to murder Peter Fabiano. Because Joan Rebel didn't want to do it herself, I guess, but she drove the getaway car and she paid for the 38 caliber pistol, which was purchased in a gun store in Pasadena, which is about 20 miles to the east. All right, so what else can I tell you? Well, there's quite a bit I can tell you. First of all, uh, this brilliant plan didn't include how to dispose of the murder weapon. You know, like the Manson family for just winging it and going over and killing some people, they were very professional because there was no murder weapon ever found for the Cielo Drive or Waverly Drive crimes. There's no, there were weapons that were uh, introduced into the murder trial, but they weren't murder weapons used in the crime. In fact, they weren't murder weapons at all. They were just props. But in this case, we don't have any props. We don't have, uh, but we do have a murder weapon because it turns out that... Uh, Golden A. Pizer just winged it, and she went over to uh, a fancy uh, upscale retail store, and she just dropped the gun in a storage locker where it was found by an employee of the store and turned over to Los Angeles police detectives who were very easily tracing the gun back to the Pasadena store, and the registered owner was, was Golden A. Pizer. So first rule is don't use guns that are registered in your own name. So that's what they did. And then that's how the police were arrested her. She then immediately ratted out her her partner in crime, Joan Rebel. It was her idea. She's then arrested. You know, it's uh, they have a lesbian relationship that we don't want to talk about because that's a felony crime. So the district attorney doesn't want to pursue lesbian um, crimes, hetero homosexual crimes, they prefer to do the homicide instead. So they hatch a, a, a plea agreement where these two are to see psychiatrists, of course, just like the McMartin school case, right? Just like the Menendez case, right? Is you get the psychiatrists involved. And then whenever I hear psychiatrists get involved, I know that we'll never get anywhere toward the truth. So at that point, I'm losing control of the story because these two see a psychiatrist. 
Then they go to what I believe is a preliminary hearing. The media at one point called it the murder trial. Then they called it the um, grand jury. And I'm calling it neither. Because, look, they were already arrested. The judge already issued an arrest warrant. When you find a gun used in the commission of a murder, you can issue an arrest warrant for the registered owner. So we don't need to go to the grand jury. And we don't need to have any... Uh, trial because it's going to be a slam dunk, right? And these two are homosexuals. So so they're going to sign a plea agreement, which they did. And the plea agreement was five years to life in prison for both of these women, the women being Golden A. Pizer and Joan Rebell. One was the shooter and one drove the getaway car. That's the, the gist of it. Betty Fabiano, there was speculation that she was involved in the love triangle and maybe she participated in a conspiracy to kill her husband. But of course, that was never pursued by the district attorney. And there's really no proof of that. So, you know, it fits into, did Angela Lansbury sign a permission slip for her daughter to spend time with the Manson girls? Uh, who cares? Okay. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. Does it have anything to do with the murder of Sharon Tate? No, no. Does it have anything to do with anything? No, not really. I mean, it's a distraction. It's a diversion. Now, in this case, did Betty Fabiano get involved? I don't know, but it's really going to be really difficult to prove that. But we do have the shooter, and we have the woman who drove the getaway car who belonged to a friend of hers. She didn't drive her own car. She drove a friend of hers car named Margaret. Anyway, that's how they got caught. And um, I don't even know when they got out of prison because that information has been expunged. And I know that... Golden A died at age uh, 84 in 1998. She passed away, the, the killer of Peter Fabiano. And I don't know how many years she spent in prison. My guess would be she spent three to five years, you know, the minimum divided in half, maybe two and a half years. And then she was released probably, you know, in her mid 40s. She should have been like 46, 47, 48 years old. And uh, Joan Rebell, same thing. She would have been out in her, you know, by age 44, 45 and uh, disappeared never to be heard from again and uh and then betty fabiano never remarried and she died at age 81 in the year 1999 you know when william shatner's third wife drowned face down in the swimming pool in studio city what right about the time that that was happening betty fabiano the beguiling redhead she died out in palm desert you know, out there toward uh, Palm, Palm Springs. All right, that's my Halloween story. Uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with CIA or clandestine services that I can tell. Uh, it did happen in a CIA zip code known as Hollywood and North Hollywood. And, and it did happen near the Burbank uh, Lockheed Martin controlled airport. So to that extent, it happened in the CIA zip code. I'll, I'll say that, but uh, that's all I'll say. Anyway, have a great uh, day and hit the like or subscribe. Talk to you soon. Bye now.